Welcome to Front and Center, from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. Hello, I'm Michael Maxeni, and before we introduce our guest, who I'm very honored we can bring to you today, let me introduce my partner, Steve Berriman. Steve, take it away, please. Thank you so much, Michael. And yes, we're really pleased to have as our guest, Tom Hartman. He's been ranked by Talkers Magazine as a number one progressive talk show host in America for more than 10 years. His show airs live nationwide daily, Monday through Friday on Sirius XM from 12 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. Tom is also a four-time Project Censored award-winning New York Times bestselling author of more than 30 books in 17 languages. He has co-written and been featured in six climate-related documentaries with Leonard DiCaprio and his book, The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, about the end of the oil age and climate change. It's an international bestseller and used as a textbook in many schools and colleges. Now, it turns out I first met Tom in 1999 when he was on tour with that book, and we've been friends ever since. In regards to his radio career, I remember there was one point where we visited him in Portland, where he was doing both his national show on Air America and a local show, five hours a day of radio, five days Thanks. a week. So <laughs> I, I can't Thanks. imagine where he got the time, uh, maybe the daylight savings time left over. I don't know. But... I, I was impressed. Um, and so anyway, about two months ago, uh, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, Stephanie uh, Austin, Ecoastrology, reprinted an article that Tom had written back in 1998 called The Lost People. And this article stopped me live in my tracks because at a time when we're rightfully addressing the domination uh, and decimation of native peoples and the enslavement of black Africans, this article that he wrote addresses the domination of the indigenous peoples of Europe. And given that here we are three white guys on this call, our ancestors. So let's start with that. Tom, tell us about how this article came about and why the title, The Lost People. There's a, uh, uh, a magazine published in uh, Northern Massachusetts, um, uh, called Spirit of Change, and uh, the woman who published the, the magazine, uh, Carol Bedrosian's um, significant other at the time, I haven't talked to her in quite a number of years, so I'm not sure where she's at right now, but um, she was in a relationship with a Native American guy, and they, they did a lot of Na Native American events and Native American themed stuff, and they had this uh, event in, as I recall, in 98, um, called the... Um, Oh, if you've got the article there, it's 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 in there. But it was basically a council fire. It was it was you know one of these. Uh, they invited a bunch of people to come, and they they invited elders from a series of of uh, traditions. Uh, I was there as the white elder. Um, there was a, a guy from uh, Peru who was representing an indigenous group down there. Uh, in fact, he brought he brought some great coca leaf with him. Um, there was uh, a fellow by the name of Frank, who I was sitting next to, who has passed away since, uh, who was representing a native uh, tribe or confederation of tribes in southern Canada and southern Ontario. Um, there were uh, multiple other Native Americans there. There were a couple of Africans there, people who had, you know, literally come from Africa, representing indigenous people in Africa. And the the goal of the whole thing was to allow basically to have a talking circle and allow these elders to speak and what happened was um there were i don't know a couple hundred young people there um, almost all uh you know young white kids many of them dressed like in buckskin and dressed up like mm -hmm. indians and um they would they were just not being respectful uh, of the elders and some of them were jumping under the ropes you know that the, the spacer and 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 saying you know why are why is there a hierarchy here and stuff like that and uh it it kind of dragged out to the point where a number of us elders never got a chance to speak and i had outlined uh, a little riff that i was going to do which is what this article became and um so anyhow, I'm, I'm sitting there around this fire and Frank, uh, Frank and I had been uh, talking a lot that day and he leans over and he says, he points to a, a, a couple of young people in the front row who were dressed in buckskin. 
you know, obviously, you know, wealthy white kids and says, um, what's with these people or what's with you people? He said, I don't understand. He says, my, my people have been, uh, you know, tortured, murdered, chased, harassed, uh, had our land stolen. We've, we've been dismissed. We've been imprisoned. We've been murdered. We've been put on reservations. Why on earth would you people want to try to dress like us and try to become Indians? What, what I just, you know, I don't get it. And that provoked a uh, uh, probably the, 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 the one third of this article that I had come intending to speak about uh, kind of got set aside and the, and the remaining two thirds of the article was my response to Frank, frankly. And, and, and you know, and what I said was that, uh, you know, we are basically hungry ghosts and you know, I can go into detail. I don't know to what extent you want me to just ramble on here as opposed to answer questions. Um, but why don't you ramble about that? Because I think that that's really uh, maybe not many of our uh, of our viewers and listeners have, have seen this piece. And so I think it's uh, it's really important to, to flesh out what your response was to Frank sure. and uh, and so on. Yeah, well, and in fact, I had a conversation with Frank about this uh, that evening. And, and then, you know, like I said, I reduced it to writing the next morning. Um, and Carol published it. Um, you know, what I said to him is that, uh, imagine Frank, I said, you know, you know your people's language. He, he spoke actually several native languages. Um, I said, you know, the, 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 the sacred, you know, the four directions, you know, that tobacco is a sacred herb, you know, I, you know, I mean, you can walk through the forest and know what plants are are sacred and what plants are, you know, good for you and what points plants are bad and all this kind of stuff. Um, you, you understand the relationship between humanity and the planet. Um, you have literally 10,000 years worth of culture that you carry in the stories that you carry, in the languages that you carry, in the relationships that you have. And, uh, and he was like, yeah, you know, of course. And, and I said, you know, imagine if the best efforts of, uh, of my people, you know, of the Europeans who came here and, and <laughs> discovered this already occupied continent, imagine if their best efforts had been successful and they had wiped out your languages and nobody spoke any native language. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of them still spoken in North America. What if nobody spoke any of them? What if they had succeeded, the, the Catholics, uh, you know, who, who uh, authorized this whole thing back in the 1400s and 1500s, what if they had succeeded in, in destroying every, every last semblance of your religion? What if nobody knew how to make a sweat lodge? What if nobody even knew what it was? What if nobody understood, uh, you know, how to, how to do a, a sun ceremony? Or, I mean, it's just what if all of that was gone? And, and he's starting to look a little distressed. And I said, uh, you know, uh, uh, imagine if you had no connection to your ancient ancestors at all, if you had no way to understand, you know, to look at uh, a wampum or, or any of the old uh, ways of, of recording things and, and, you, and you just had no idea what any of it meant. And, and I said, can you imagine, you know, what, how you would feel if that had happened? And he, and he, and he was like, that would be devastating. It would just be an overwhelming horror. And I was like, yeah. And that's what happened to my people. And he's like, what? And, and I said, 3,000 years ago, my people in Europe lived tribally. They were indigenous people, just like your ancestors were. And, uh, in fact, actually, and I didn't get into this in the article, but um, one of the things that really cued me to this was uh, reading uh, Thomas Jefferson's writings back in around 2000. We bought a house and uh, there was a collection of his writings there and I just read the whole thing. And his diaries were just, uh, and his letters, he was uh, an absolute aficionado, a fan of uh, the, what were referred to as the Whig histories. There were two competing, in the 1700s, there were two competing historical stories about the history of England. 
And one was David Hume, who was kind of the conservative uh, British writer who basically started history with the first kings. And the other was a guy by, by the name of Paul de Rapin de Torras, who wrote a book called The History of England. Um, which is now out of print. Although I think, you know, I, I've, I've written about this in, in a number of places and I, I think somebody might've found a copy and, and, you know, made one of these instant print versions. Um, I found one in a bookstore in London that it cost me almost a thousand dollars. It's, it's right there. <laughs> and, um, and, and read it. And, you know, I mean, it's really hard to read because the Fs are all like Fs and, you know, it's just written in an anachronistic language. But basically what uh, Taras is writing about is the tribal people of England before the Norman invasion, before the Roman invasion, you know, and, and, and then uh, Jefferson also talks about Tacitus and Agricola. And so I got a copy of Tacitus's book. And again, uh, you know, published in the 1700s, one that would have been contemporary for Jefferson and read that it's on the bookshelf behind me too. And um, it was, it just blew my mind. I mean, you know, these people were living tribally and, and this is the point that Jefferson kept making. He was, he was so enamored of the native Americans. Of course, when his father, his father was a, a surveyor and uh, surveyed Virginia. And so he would travel when he was young, when he was like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, uh, his father died when he was 15. He would travel around the state with his father and stay with these different Native American communities. His father spoke six native languages. Uh, Peter uh, Jefferson was his name. So, you know, I, I, I already had a little bit of this, right? It, it kind of floating around in my head. And, and I said to Frank, I said, you know, 3,000 years ago, the uh, Celts came through and, uh, you know, organized Europe into trading communities, but um, uh, they, they stripped everybody's, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, culture. They just stripped out the culture. And then a thousand years after that, 2000 years ago, the Romans came through and they didn't just strip out culture, they stripped out language. All the, all the, the European languages now, almost all the European languages now are based in Latin and, uh, or the, you know, the, 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 the Germ Germanic languages. Um, but, you know, that was the Romans who did that. And, and then a thousand years ago, the Catholics came through and did the same thing. And they destroyed all the ancient holy places and, and uh, declared the people who still knew the old religions and, and knew the, you know, the herbs and the healing and the ceremonies, and they called them witches and they tortured them and they burned them and they hung them. And, uh, you know, it was just all gone. You know, I, I told him that, you know, when I was uh, uh, younger, when my father was still alive, we, we uh, my father's father uh, is a, was an, an immigrant, both his father and his mother were immigrants from Norway in 1917. And so uh, after my grandfather died, we, we went to Norway and visited his family house, which is still occupied by relatives of mine, or, or was then, this was 30 years ago. And um, in the backyard of this house in Grimstad, Norway is an old stone um, with runic writing on it. And you know, it, it, nobody knows how to read it. Nobody knows how to speak the words. Nobody knows what it means for sure. I mean, you know, there's, there's lots of theories and all this, but. But, you know, the Catholics conquered Norway 800 years ago, and that was the end of that. And, uh, you know, now everybody goes to church and prays to Jesus. And um, so I said, you know, this, this is what happened to my people. Three successive waves about a thousand years apart in Europe, first the Celts, then the Romans, then the Catholics, just scrubbed Europe of any semblance, Europeans of any semblance of connection to their ancient past. We now refer to that as prehistory as if it doesn't exist when we think of these ancient times we see in black and white and they're silent there's no you know there's no moving pictures and there's no audio and uh you know it's just you, you think of people you know sitting in under mud huts you know in the in the rain being miserable and of course that isn't what it was like indigenous people have rich and meaningful lives just like all people do um so anyhow you know that was that was kind of my analysis of, of, of what has happened that that we are a people, and, and I think this is what has largely driven this cultural psychosis of conquering and genocidal war and all these other things. We are a people who have been disconnected from our tribal roots. And not only that, the other, the other point that I made, and I think it's a really important one, in fact, I think it's the most important point, is that 
cultures learn by trial and error over time. And when you look at the, at the history of indigenous people around the world, what you find is that repeatedly people make the mistake of wiping out their environment. Um, uh, 800 years ago, uh, there was uh, Melanesian people, uh, Southeast Asian people who got in a boat and, and got to New Zealand and uh, discovered it for the first time. There were no people there. And there were 50 different species of moa birds there, um, some as large as ostriches, some as small as a chicken. Uh, but they were completely unafraid of humans. You could just walk up to them and break their necks and eat them. And so these uh, Melanesian travelers, they, they are called the Mori, which means people who eat the moa birds. And for 300 years, they went on this binge of eating these birds and they just stripped the island of all the moa birds. And finally, they ate the last one. I mean, they're, they're extinct. And then they started eating the fish in the nearby waters and they fished out the waters. And then they started, and then they ate all the small mammals that they could find down to rats. And then they were eating amphibians and frogs. And then, then they were experiencing famine in, in New Zealand. And at that point, they started forming, uh, they formed, a, I think as I really call it, it was 32, maybe it's 36 or 38 um, tribal kind of villages essentially on the island. And they all went to war with each other and they would, uh, literally take prisoners as meat on the hoof. Uh, they started practicing cannibalism because they were so protein deficient. And, um, you know, if you go about 400 miles northwest of there, northeast of there to uh, British New Caledonia. So, so well, let me fin finish this. So when um, Captain Cook in the 1770s arrived at, uh, he called it Murderer's Cove or Murderer's Bay, uh, in New Zealand, when he first arrived in New Zealand, um, discovered it. Um, he also discovered Hawaii, you know, and all that. But anyhow, he, he discovered this island of New Zealand, and and um, he he brought his ships up close, and they his uh, number two guy got in the in the boat, and along with a half a dozen crew members, and they were going to row up to the to the to the shore and say hi to the natives. And, uh, but they didn't realize that this was a culture that had become totally warlike and, and, and cannibalistic. And so the Maori jumped in their canoes and uh, dugouts and, and, and rowed out to there. And they thought they were meeting them for, you know, hey, how you doing? And instead the Maori, uh, you know, flipped the boat and, and took, uh, murdered, killed several of the crew members and the, the two that they didn't kill, they took them up on the shore and, and uh, uh, slaughtered them and then roasted them and ate them. And, you know, while Captain Cook is watching and uh, he sailed off just absolutely horrified by this. So that was a culture that was like in the process of making this cultural transition. Um, then he goes a couple hundred miles Northeast and runs into British, what we refer to as British New Caledonia, which had been occupied about 500 years earlier than New Zealand by Melanesian travelers. They had arrived there like 1600 years ago. And they went through the exact same cycle. They ate all the moa birds. They wiped out the island. They, they destroyed much of the foliage. Um, they fished out the waters. And then they rebooted their culture. They were like, you know, holy cow, we can't live this way. And by the time Captain Cook showed up, they had made this complete cultural transmission, uh, transition and were living in harmony with their environment, in complete balance with their environment. They had developed religions that were cooperative and, and caring, and they had gone through a cannibal phase, you know, in a war phase during, you know, early on, and which you, you can find the, the, the remnants of it. And um, Captain Cook wrote in his diaries, uh, these are the happiest people I've ever met in, in the world. This place is a true paradise. Life here, you know, is better than any human could ever imagine. Um, you know, he was blown away by it. So, you know, we, we see that societies figure out through typically through terrible mistakes, how to, how to live, particularly in terms of their environment. And the same thing apparently happened here in North America. You had tribes, I mean, you know, North America was first populated somewhere between 20 and 30,000 years ago. And over a period of time up toward, you know, particularly in the, in the thousand or 2000 years after the end of the ice age, excuse me, about 8,000 years ago, um, you had uh, people who uh, were uh, 
grow, you know, populations will grow to meet the limit of the food supply. That's, that's kind of a, a basic mm -hmm. law of nature. You know, Thomas Malthus wrote about this back in the days. And, and uh, you know, if you, if you have, and, and they tend to balance out. I mean, if you've got a lot of rabbits, then uh, the fox population will come up and then the rabbit population will go down and then the fox population will go down and then the rabbit population. And, and there's always this kind of stasis. This is sort of what Darwin uh, identified with the finches with the hard, you know, big beak and small beaks. Mm -hmm. And you know, eating all the lard, you know, the hard to crack uh, seeds, and then when they wiped out those seeds, then the smaller ones had, you know, and they they went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Who had the evolutionary advantage? And so uh, the population of North America grew to hit the limits of its food, mm -hmm. and the result of that was, and there's plenty in the archaeological record to show this. The result of that was uh, devastation, environmental devastation, all over North America all over the Americas. And what uh, most tribes learned from that was how to live in balance with their environment. This was a hard learned lesson, but they wiped out the giant three-toed sloth, sloth, or they wiped out the, the uh, woolly mammoths, they wiped out the, well, maybe those uh, were, you know, there's a debate about climate change on those. Uh, they wiped out uh, a, a small kind of camel-like animal. They, there were a whole bunch of mammals that were large and and easy to kill and eat. They just got, just, you know, went extinct as a consequence of humans running around in North America. And so uh, these today's tribal people, Native American people have the memory of that. Um, you know, when I lived in Vermont, the, you know, the Abenaki, uh, there was a, a, a local, you know, the Vermont Public Radio, they were interviewing a guy who um, was an anthropologist and he was, looking at the Ab Abenaki stories. And the Abenakis have stories about when the walls of blue ice receded. Now that was 10,000 years ago, the end of the ice age. And so he, they, this, this team from the University of Vermont went out and looked at the, uh, the remaining you know, the gravel um, uh, records. <laughs> I mean, you can see where the gravel is, where the stones are, where the glaciers stopped, when they receded, how far they receded, at what time and in what order. And what they found was that the Abenaki stories about that time were accurate, that this is literally a 10,000 year old memory that these people still carry. And so, you know, my message to Frank was, you know, I'm, I'm guessing my ancestors 3000 years ago had figured out how to live in balance with their environment in Europe. But, you know, they got completely blown up. And the reason why this is a crisis, obviously, for all of us now is that this time uh, we are making the same stupid mistake, only we're not doing it on a local basis where, you know, a tribe might die out or a local ecosystem might be destroyed. We're doing it on a planet wide basis. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly right. So we're, we're at a point where we may not have the time on the learning curve that all of these uh, indigenous people had. Uh, yeah, uh, Michael, you got a question? You need to unmute your mic, Michael. He's immutable. <laughs> Hard to be immutable. immutable. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that very condensed, obviously, history. Two questions I'd like you to, to try to briefly answer because we, uh, there's some important points of your story, The Lost People, that I want to make sure we get into in the limited time that we have. First off, how did you learn such incredible depth of this history? And two, why do, is that not taught in our education systems by ones that I've come today? Yeah. Such an well, important history. Yeah, the, the things that informed me, I mean, I've, I've always, I, I, I think most, um, most uh, European ancestry Americans have a fascination with Native Americans and, and, and things indigenous and Aboriginal. Um, so I was always curious, but um, the, the, you know, reading, reading Jefferson's uh, letters and diaries is what led me to uh, Paul de Rapin de Terras and to Tacitus and Agricola. Um, that was one point and and reading Jefferson's rants I mean he would go on these long rants in his correspondences particularly with Ben Rush and with John Adams about how uh, David Hume was a, a poseur and a, and, a, and a phony and you know the the whole British history was just the history of the royalty and 
And these conservatives, you know, these conservative British historians were not interested in the lives of average people, and they were not interested in the lives of the people before the, you know, the rise of the of the of the royal families. And and uh, he used to rant about, you know, the the three tyrannies, um, the, you know, the tyranny of the rich, uh, the tyranny of the churches, and the tyranny of the warlords. Basically, you know, that that always every country was always governed by one of those three, either either the warlord kings, which is how most of the royal family started. And then you know, they bring in the religious people who said that they could uniquely talk to God and knew how to run things. And, and uh, you know, uh, so, and, and then and of course, as nations became wealthier, the rich would uh, take over those positions. And all of this offended him terribly. Um, so that, that got my curiosity going, that was 20 years ago. Um, but, you know, back in the 60s, as I recall, uh, was really where I think I got started on this. And that was reading Peter Farb's book, uh, Man's Rise to Civilization. Let's see if I've got, yeah, I've got a copy here, but I'm not sure where it is. It's probably in the other room. Um, but he wrote, a, Peter Farb was a, a, an ethno-historian, an, an anthropologist. And he wrote a book called Man's Rise to Civilization and the Native American. Uh, the title is actually longer than that. I'm sorry, I don't remember every word of it, right. um, but it's easy to find. It's, you can find used copies on you know, your favorite bookstore. And um, what Farb did, uh, and, and before that, actually, he had written a book about three years before he published that, he had written a book called, um, uh, called S Human Civilization. I'd have to go back and look, but anyhow, he, uh, Farb, what Farb did is he did a deep dive into first contact with Native Americans in, uh, on this continent. Um, he, was, he was curious what the very first people to encounter the Hopi had to say, what the very first people to encounter the Lakota, what the very first people to encounter the Potawatomi, uh, the Shoshone, what did they report? Because he felt that those were the, the accurate descriptors of you know what those societies were really like, um, you know. Keep in mind, even the Plains Indians were pedestrians; they didn't have horses. Europeans brought horses from Europe, so you know we we altered their cultures tremendously in a very short period of time. Um, so Farb wanted to know what were they really like, and what he found was that there were these, uh, as I recall, it was thirty eight different that he profiled, just startlingly different civilizations. Um, there was one in, uh, that I remember really well. I mean, it's been, it's been probably 40 years since I read the book, but um, so please forgive any errors I have for anybody who's reading it now and, um, you know, oh, it was 36 or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, it, it was a society down in the area that we would call New Orleans right now. And uh, they, they were settled. They were agriculturalists. They, had, they built pyramids. And uh, they had uh, come up with a system to make sure that even though there's a natural tendency in agricultural societies for hierarchies to emerge, that every person would be connected to everybody in society. So they had four classes or castes. The top one was called the sun gods. There were two middle ones, and I can't remember their names. And the bottom one was called the stinkards. <laughs> and the stinkards did things like, you know, clean the toilets and the sun gods were like the administrators and ran the ran the country. And then the people in the middle were like, you know, the merchants and the and the physicians and stuff like that. But every you could only marry two castes away from the caste you were born into. So if you were born into caste number one, you had to marry into caste number three or four. If you were born into caste number two, you had to ma marry into caste four or one or like this, you know? And so every family had members of every caste in it and everybody had relations in all castes. And the result of that was a society that did have hierarchy and yet existed in harmony. And I mean, it's just like the, the wild diversity, the one society that he documented that held slaves, people talk, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, well, Native Americans held slaves too. The, the one society was uh, in the Pacific Northwest and it was a society where the salmon ran twice a year and that was their principal food source. And uh, this is a point that uh, Dan Quinn made in his book Ishmael back years ago. 
um, that you know where he posits that the whole the whole of Western civilization rests on the idea of somebody locked up the food, that money is simply meta to food, and that after the agricultural revolution, once we started growing food, we started producing large quantities of food, but it was food that had to be stored from season to season. And so somebody had to store that food and they had to do it in a way that animals couldn't get into. It meant doing it in a way that people couldn't get into. Somebody locked up the food. Well, somebody who locked up the food decided to say to everybody else, oh, you're hungry? <laughs> well, come and do what I tell you and I'll give you some food. And thus was born kingdoms, right? And hierarchy and all this kind of stuff. So um, uh, that that one tribe that, that only had salmon twice a year uh, turned into a fairly hierarchical tribe and, 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 and held slaves. And, you know, which seems to be a characteristic of a lot of societies. I mean, people forget the Greeks had slaves. In fact, more than half of all the people in Athens were slaves uh, at the time of the Athenian democracy. Uh, the Romans had slaves. I mean, everybody held slaves at one point or another, it seems, uh, you know, thousands of years ago. It was very much the norm. I mean, it's in the Bible, you know, uh, Paul says, be nice to your slaves, you know, like the, the assumption that, of course, everybody has. So, um, you know, it was just this incredible diversity of cultures across North America. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, visiting Norway and, and I lived in Germany for a year. I, I did a deep dive into German mysticism, into the, the old Nazi mysticism that was actually based on way back pre-Nazi mysticism. Um, so, I, you know, that, in, in answer to your first question, Michael, that's, that's how I came across all this history. It's just you know, a lifetime of curiosity about these kind of issues. What was the second question you asked? Why do you think it's not being taught? Today? Oh yeah. Well, that was that was. <laughs> I refer you to Jefferson's rants because <laughs> <laughs> I mean he was very clear about this. And that that David Hume and the other historians of of, of Britain in the 1700s were simply telling the story of the royal families because they were the toadies of the royal families. You know, people make jokes about how, you know, in school we study dead white guys, um, but it's true. We, we study the people who are the leaders of society. We, we know very little of, I mean, I'm, I'm sure anthropologists and, and archaeologists know a lot, but the average person who just goes through high school knows very little about what the life of the average person was like, um, you know, in, in, in England in the 1600s. But they can tell you all about Henry VIII, you know, and, and Anne Boleyn. And you know, so so basically, uh, the people who get to decide what is history are the ones who control the society, and the ones who control the society are the ones who figure that their history is the only history worth telling. And uh, you know, while that's kind of a crass description of it, I think it's actually a very accurate one. And um, uh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Tom, Tom, you made two references. Uh, one was, a, was uh, to Daniel uh, Quinn's book, uh, Ishmael, and the other was to uh, The Hungry Ghost. And uh, as I recall, Daniel Quinn uses the term takers uh, and so on. And yeah, takers and leaders. Yeah. Takers and leaders. Yeah. And so it, it seems to me that when people have been traumatized by lack of history or uh, only having a history where they're uh, either have to be oppressed or oppressors, that kind of leads to this um, uh, this sense of if I don't, if I, the only way I'm going to get what I need is to take it, uh, to compete, et cetera, et cetera. How do you see the relationship between the, the lost people, and I see why you call them the lost people, hungry ghosts, and, and where we are today and uh, in, in our society? Well, you know, I wrote about this in, in 96 in Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, too, that um, that our society is, I referred to it as a younger society and, and referred to Aboriginal people who have learned the lesson and gone through that cycle that the Maori were in the middle of and the New Caledonians mm -hmm. had completed, uh, as had most of the Native American tribes of North America, uh, as older cultures. And that our younger culture just doesn't know a lot of these things. Um, uh, Rupert Ross wrote a book called Dancing with the Ghost. And I don't think I referenced that in the article, but it, it's apropos of this. Uh, if, you, 
there, there's two books that I strongly recommend in addition to Peter Farb's writings, if you find this stuff fascinating. Uh, Rupert Ross is Dancing with a Ghost and uh, Robert Wolf's uh, book. Uh, the original title was uh, What It Means to Be Human. Um, it got reprinted. I, it was out of print. I read, I found a, a friend of mine gave me a copy for my birthday, out of, an out of print copy. And I read it and it just blew my mind. I contacted Robert Wolf and um, got it back in print. And so it's, it's back in print now, I think. Robert died a couple of years ago in his 90s, um, but uh, it's called Original Wisdom. And um, Ross in his book, he was a lawyer. He's a Canadian, he was a Canadian lawyer and he was sent up into the Northern Territories uh, to, uh, to work with, on behalf of the government, to work with some of the native tribes. Um, and he tells, a number of just mind-blowing stories. One was of this woman whose uh, son was just going through a very, very difficult time. And uh, he went out and hanged himself, committed suicide, hanged himself in a tree in her front yard. And she watched this happen through the window of her house. And the police came you know, to investigate the death and she told them what happened. And they said, why didn't you stop him? And she said, that's not our way. You don't interfere in other people's lives. You know, non-interference is like a core value of this tribe. Hmm. And they prosecuted her for manslaughter. And Ross was involved in helping defend her. And through that story, you get this extraordinary sense of what a culture would be like if people didn't tell other, everybody else how to live. And my wife read that book. At the time that we read that, our kids were teenagers. This was 20 years ago or more. And, um, and she just said, we're going to adopt this. We're never going to tell our children what to do again unless they ask. If they ask, we'll tell them whatever we think. But, and we're going to tell them that this is what we're doing. And I was like, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. And she was like, no, no, this is what we're going to do. And we did. And I think our kids turned out really great. And it sure did make parenting a hell of a lot easier. So, you know, there's, there's that kind of insight. And then uh, Robert Wolf's story is absolutely amazing. Uh, Robert was a psychologist and he was hired by the government of um, either Malaysia or Indonesia, I forget which, I think it was Malaysia, um, to figure out why this one tribe of people uh, the Sonoy, S apostrophe N O I, or maybe I think it's five letters, but anyway, the Sonoy people, why they were lazy. And the government couldn't figure this out. There were these rubber plantations that were spreading across the, you know, the, the country. And, you know, uh, indigenous people were leaving their land and coming to work on the rubber plantations and, and, you know, making money and building houses and getting drunk and you know, all this kind of stuff. And the Sonoy had nothing, they would have nothing to do with it. And they moved every, they lived in the jungle and they moved every, every uh, uh, week or two, you know, from place to place. So they would live someplace for a couple of weeks. They would eat all the food around them. Um, and then they would move, you know, 40 miles away and live there for a couple of weeks and eat all the food around. And then, and by the time they came back to the place where they had started, it was like 20 years later and it had regenerated. And so it was a completely ecologically balanced system, but you never knew where they were. And Robert was supposed to go interview them for the government. And so uh, he goes, there was this uh, road that just like, like these roads in Nevada, you know, that just goes straight through for 400 miles. And there's like one little road going off <laughs> that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just mile, hundreds of miles of jungles on the right. And on the left was whatever, I think, it, you know, whatever it was. And there was this little country store in the, on this road and behind the country store was a little trail that went into the jungle back about a mile or so. And then at the end of the trail, there was a stump and that was it. And then you were in the jungle and you had no idea, you know, you, there's just the trail to the, to the country store. And so Robert uh, found that the country store was the place to enter the jungle to find the Sinai. And so he visited the store and the guy says, well, there's the path. And so he walks this path. And when he gets to the end, there's a guy sitting on the stump, hmm. one of the Sinai people. And Roberts was like, oh, what a wonderful coincidence. And the guy's like, yeah, cool. 
And so they had a conversation and, and Robert left and wrote up some notes. And then he came back about four or five days later and he takes another walk back along that path. And there's a different guy sitting on a stump. And Robert has a long conversation with him and comes back. And the third time he goes back and there's a third guy, a different guy sitting on the stump. And Robert has now come to the conclusion that this is like their lookout station, right? That this is where they hold off the barbarians. And this guy invites him to come visit the camp. And so Robert follows him for like a half a day through the jungle, you know, in a path that he can't even figure out and gets to this little camp where the Sonoy were living and spends about a week with them, uh, you know, and what he discovers is that, first of all, when they sleep, they all sleep together. Everybody has to touch somebody. You, you, you put, your foot is on this person's stomach or that, you know, whatever. Um, and they believe that the dream world is the real world and that this world is the dream world. And number one, and number two, they dream things. And when they wake up in the morning, what they, the, the whole morning is spent, everybody discussing their dreams. And it comes out in conversation over the course of a few days. Robert is like, how come nobody's gone to go sit on the stump? And they're like, oh, we only do, do that when we dream that somebody's coming to visit. And Robert was like, what? And they were like, oh, yeah, three times we dreamed that you were going to come and visit. So three times we had to send somebody to meet. And, you know, it just it blows his mind, you know. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll leave you at that point. Uh, the book is it's called Original Wisdom by Robert Wolf. And it's just, uh, you know, it, it, it'll scramble your brain. Uh, but it's solid, you know, and Robert had you know, a PhD and two PhDs, one in psychology and one in anthropology. And Louise and I got to know him really well. And in fact, I have a painting that he did hanging in the wall outside my office. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot out there that we don't understand and that we don't know. And there's a lot to learn from indigenous wisdom. And I think it's just a, a, a flaming, screaming tragedy that we have abandoned so much of it. And that that we haven't abandoned, we either uh, cartoonize uh, you know, uh, into the, the, the cartoon Indian, essentially, uh, or we denigrate. And uh, it's just, it's terrible. I, I'm, I think I've wandered far afield from your question. <laughs> well, you actually wandered into that, into the jungle. We, we like being in the jungle. <laughs> I know Mike has some more questions for you. Yeah, it, it actually is a, <laughs> is a good point. In your writing, The Lost People, you tell the story of coming across the half Aboriginal man, the old trapper named Jeff. Oh yeah, Jeff Gass. Yes. Hugely important messages that in your questions of Jeff and his answers, if you can recall Sharon, and if you can't, let me help you with your memory as I answered it. Uh, don't you hate the white people who stole you from your grandparents? Or oh, let me tell the story, Michael. Let me, let me yeah, set yeah, this up right. Yeah. Um, and I met Jeff. Uh, Jeff Jeff was running a, a camp. He had a, like a, a thousand acre ranch in the outback in Australia, uh, way out in the middle of nowhere, a little town called Petford, which is maybe 100 people. And, uh, and he wasn't even in town. He was, you know, 50 miles from town or whatever. And he had this ranch and, and he was uh, providing a play. He, he was a very good horseman. And uh, he was teaching Aboriginal kids who had been addicted to gasoline. This was the, this was the thing that was going on then. This was back in the uh, 80s, I think. Um, these kids were huffing gasoline and getting addicted to it and getting brain damaged by it. And so the Aboriginal families, parents would bring them to Jeff to straighten them out. And they would stay with him for six months or a year. And he'd teach them horseback riding and, and uh, you know, survival in the, in the wilderness. And, um, and he was, I was working with an international relief organization, Salem International, that was running programs for abandoned and abused kids all over the world. I started one in Uganda. I helped start one in, in Colombia and Peru. Uh, we started one in Israel, which is now the largest child caring institution in the country. Um, there were three of them in Germany. We started a couple of others that didn't make it. Um, but, and, and uh, a mutual friend of ours, a psychologist, actually I'd been in in Australia, uh, lecturing on attention deficit disorder, and a psychologist who knew Jeff, uh, who was from way up north, uh, said, "You got to meet this guy." 
And so he took me, you know, on this two day journey into the, you know, into the middle of nowhere to meet Jeff. And uh, Louise and I became really, really good friends with Jeff. We visited him every year in Australia and, and you know, raised money for, the, for his program and because and, he wanted to integrate his program there with the, the Salem programs around the world. And but so Jeff eventually told me his story and his story was that um, he was a half breed. He was he was uh, his mother was uh, half Aboriginal and half white and his father was white. And uh, this was, uh, Jeff is, I mean, this was literally 80 years ago, you know, uh, maybe 90 years ago. Jeff uh, was born in a time when it was illegal to be a half breed in Australia. And they, they if, uh, when the police found out that there had been these uh, children who are the products of miscegenation, I guess is the word, um, they would abduct them and take them to these giant orphanages, or they would sell them. And this is what happened to Jeff. He was he, he was three years old and he was uh, he wandered outside his mother's home in this little Aboriginal village and a policeman on horseback uh, was going by and he saw Jeff and said that kid's the wrong color and grabbed him and took him and sold him to a local uh, they call them stations there. It's a ranch. It was this huge ranch. And uh, and uh, he he became mute. Uh, he still stutters. Um, but um he he is the guy who owned the ranch forbade him to speak and uh, uh you know beat him and whipped him and 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 put him to work i mean he was slave labor and so when jeff was uh my recollection is 10 years old i you know it, it probably says in the article it's been it, it's been probably a decade since i've seen jeff um but when he was a young man he was you know not not yet uh, maybe maybe 10, 12, 13, something yeah. like that. Um, he was in the uh, in the dining hall, and the the guy who owned the ranch was there. And one of the one of the ranch hands was trying to provoke Jeff to speak, knowing that he wasn't supposed to speak, you know, in the presence of the guy who was the owner. And he was poking him and stuff and teasing him. And Jeff got really upset and and was kind of started to say something and started stuttering, and it just all fell apart for him. And and so what happened was the, uh, just turn off this phone. And so what happened was uh, Jeff uh, picked up a stone and threw it as hard as he could at this guy, hit him right in the middle of the forehead and, and then ran. And Jeff had been stashing pieces of tack and, and uh, a gun and you know he had been preparing for this escape. And he fled into the bush and he lived in the bush for a couple of years and uh, hooked up with an old Aboriginal trapper who taught him how to trap and taught him how to survive in the bush and taught him all the old Aboriginal ways and where the Quinkin places were and what the, you know, the, the, the sacred places and ceremonies. And Jeff became basically an Aboriginal elder and uh, which led him eventually to, you know, get this ranch and, and, uh, and start taking care of these kids. So that's Jeff's backstory. So I'm sitting here with Jeff, uh, you know, after I've gotten to know him fairly well, and, and I'm like, uh, you know, don't you hate these, you know, that guy who, who bought you? And he's like, no, he, he was raised in that society. He was probably treated the same way. And I'm like, well, don't you hate the, the society that, you know, that, that separated your mother from you and, 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 you know, put in these racial barriers? And he's like, no, the, he says, the people here, the white people here, were, were prisoners. They were brought from Australia, uh, from uh, England to Australia. They, 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 were, they were themselves the oppressed and the oppressed frequently become the oppressors. And, uh, you know, it was a real lesson for me. I'd, I'd never met anybody who had such a deep understanding and so much compassion for the people who had, you know, just totally screwed up his life. Uh, although he would say that, you know, he, he had a pretty good life and he did okay, but I mean, it, it might not have turned out that way. So mm. that's the story of Jeff. Thank you. You know, uh, what we're, what we're really talking about is trauma that just gets repeated over and over and over and over again in patterns. And somebody who is, you know, an individual who is enlightened as he was to recognize that this is simply the pattern of trauma playing itself out. So here we are, everything is multiplied, everything is speeded up, you know, 8 billion people now. Um, uh, there is no uh, 
hardly any separation of one culture, one society from the other. We're we're hurtling long uh, headways into uh, you know if we're not careful the Hunger Games and so on. Uh, and so, is there a way to um, transform this trauma into into uh, we all have this common history and understanding. We're all uh, the Buddhists would say that we're we're all uh, life is suffering and we've all experienced that suffering together. How how does this become? a stepping stone to actually living into and designing that that new world. Well, we could go with Buddhist Four Noble Truths. <laughs> <laughs> all life is suffering, desire is the cause of all suffering, get rid of desire, you'll get rid of suffering, and then the Eightfold Path to do that. Um, I, I wouldn't mind. I think, though, that probably a better cliche is that of psychotherapy. Um, I think most people are sufficiently familiar with mm -hmm. uh, at least the the outlines of how therapy works, and um, and 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 not. I mean, it's not even exclusive to therapy. You you find it in um, you know some of the twelve step groups and things like this. That before you can solve a problem, you have to identify it. You have to own it. You have to you have to recognize it. You have to know where it came from. Um, you have to understand its genesis. And I think until we understand the, the cultural crisis that this um, unending consumption way of life, this um, uh, Wetiko way of life uh, has brought us that we can't, we can't solve it. I, I had a conversation, I, I relate this in, in my book, Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, uh, with Professor Jack Forbes, who was the professor of Native American studies at UC Davis um, back in the day. He's passed away now, but he wrote a book called Columbus and Other Cannibals that I, blew my mind. And uh, so I went out and met him at UC Davis. And, and, and he was, you know, so very, very clear about this, that, that until Western society understands um, what, not just what they have done to Native people, but what they have lost as a consequence of doing this, the wisdom that they have lost, the, the, the uh, thousands of years, millennia of learnings that they have lost, um, there, it won't be possible to, to fix things. He, he, he described, he gave me this word, wetiko. He said, uh, wetiko is, uh, I believe it was a Lakota word. And, it, and he said, it literally translates to cannibal. It's one who eats another person's life, mm. not their flesh, but their life. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, when Native Americans were, you know, first encountered Europeans, when Europeans first came here, at least, you know, maybe the second time that they came to North America, you know, uh, Jamestown uh, kind of melted into the forest. Apparently, uh, <laughs> they said, okay, let's go live with the Indians. But um, after that, when they came with the guns and the horses and things, um, he said, basically, you know, my, my ancestors were presented with a couple of choices. Uh, they could they could run, which many of them did. Um, they could uh, integrate, um, uh, you know, which wasn't even an option in many cases. Uh, or they could uh, or they could fight, but if they fought, because the Europeans were engaging in genocidal warfare, which was largely unknown among native tribes in North America, because you have to live with the people next door. Um, and you're, you know, and, and you don't want to take their land because their ghosts are on their land and your ghosts are on your land. And so, you know, they would have wars, Indian wars, where they would do something called counting coup, which is where you draw one drop of blood and that person's out of the game. They invented lacrosse. There's a painting in the, in the Capitol building, or maybe it's in the White House, this giant painting of like thousands of Indians engaged in, you know, in this huge area in uh, upstate New York, having this lacrosse game, you know, and uh, this was something that the painter actually witnessed in the, in the 16 or 1700s. And this is how they would solve tribal disputes was by playing lacrosse. Hmm. Um, so anyhow, uh, you know, Jack Forbes was like, you know, those were our choices. And if we fought, we became you. We became Wetiko, and you know, which was in some ways maybe even the worst option. And uh, so he was like, you know, you guys, you white people, you have to solve your Wetiko problem. You have to resolve your your cannibalistic cultural insanity. 
And until you do that, life's gonna to be tough. Here we are. Here we are. Uh, we've got to move forward from here now. We've got to learn that. And that's why we wanted to have this conversation and have you bring forth this history of the lost people because so many people, including myself, until I read it, when I read that, it really opened up my eyes to wanting to learn significantly more of some of these ancient cultures. Um, but coincidentally, or, or it was meant to be, there are some ways that people can today get a grasp besides the wonderful books, which I'll try to get a list of some of those up on the description of the show when, we're, when we put it up. Uh, but there are some great series, not necessarily very accurate and they're glamorized and stuff, but Netflix does offer some series there and there's other places to get some documentaries that go back to what happened uh, throughout the world in many of these cultures, what went on in with the Medici's and the series, the Medici's, uh, and there's others that you that. a glimpse into <laughs> that. Yeah, to see what has gone on. And now with this shared trauma, from an understanding of this shared trauma, hopefully we can embrace each other and say, now with what resources we have today, how can we help heal the immediacy of the genocides and things we've, we've just recently done in our history, but now embrace each other and say, boy, let's time to stop this age of separation and let's begin an age of reunion, of coming together and in this endless cycle of trauma on the, those people less fortunate than ourselves. Yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. And, uh, or to reframe that slightly, uh, the trauma for those people that uh, we and our culture and our society have traumatized, you know? And I mean, we've traumatized ourselves in the process, but um, we have crushed a lot of people over the years and um, we have a big debt. Uh, last year, uh, when the Black Lives Matters movement uh, happened, uh, my wife Trudy happened to come across at a, at a yard sale, the entire uh, Roots series from the 1970s. So we went and we watched Roots. And I think in a certain regard, you could say things in the 70s that you can't say now. It was so stark. It was so, uh, I mean, I grew up pretty much in an all black neighborhood as, as a white kid. So I figured I knew the culture. I knew nothing yeah. because I could leave there. I could leave there and, uh, and be a white kid in the rest of New York City. And it was one of the most profoundly sobering things about what it was like to know that you have a culture and then lose that. Yeah. And keeping those threads of that culture alive through the most inhumane of situations. Yeah, you know, I never watched her. It's, I, should, I should go back and do that. It, it, uh, it happened during a time that, I think we were living in Europe when that movie, when that show came, movie came out. Yeah. Let me, share, let me share with you, uh, your, I would, maybe you're familiar with this, the story of the black dog, the, the white mountain Apache story. Are you familiar with that? Familiar. Let me share with that because I think it might give us a good place and I'd love to get your, your reaction. The Black Dog. An old woman has been long at work weaving a beautiful rug. As she nears its completion, she pauses to stir a soup. When she stirs the soup, however, her black dog, asleep in the corner, awakens, pulls on a loose thread and causes the rug to unravel. Where there was beauty and harmony, there is now confusion and chaos. But the old woman, returning from stirring the soup, is unfazed. She stares into the disorder, picks up a loose thread, and reimagines a new way to restore beauty and harmony. And that's where we're at. Yeah, it's time to put the rug back together. <laughs> yeah. How can we reimagine going forward? Yeah, I, you know, I, I really think that um, our society 
you know, increasingly it, you look at these movements like the Sunrise Movement, you know, young people who are concerned about the environment, mm -hmm. um, uh, who are looking to indigenous people for support and wisdom, you know, the, the, the anti-pipeline uh, folks in the upper Midwest have been mostly Native Americans or largely Native Americans. Um, of course, some of that is because the pipelines are running through tribal lands, but um, uh, I, I think that the, the, the integration of ancient wisdom with modern life is something that we really need to have happen. And we need to do it in a way that isn't just another new age cliche um, or another new, uh, you know, cafeteria religion. Um, I'll take a little of this and a little of that, you know, but instead is, is a, a deep dive into what humans have learned through painful experience. In some cases, you know, society ending experiences uh, over the over the millennia. We got a lot of work to do, guys. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for joining us today. And we loved your ramble because we learned so much. There's just so much in there that you've uh, that you've cooked up over the years, and uh, there's a lot of food for thought in this uh, in this conversation. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Thanks Tom. So much. I can't thank you enough. Um, Pleasure to be here. You've really added a significant uh, piece of the puzzle to help us move forward. Um, and to our audience, we hope that you found this conversation enlightening. We invite you to follow front and center. And if you can, please support our work by subscribing. That way, Steve and I can pay our rent and continue this work. From political battlefields to cooperative playing fields, it's a long journey. Let us go there together. Thank you.